Welcome to the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast, where we exist for the glory of God and the tone of his people. I'm Cody Fields, the president of Westminster Effects. Go buy stuff for your guitar. WestminsterEffects.com. Join the discussion in the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast Lounge on Facebook. And make sure you subscribe and follow and all that good stuff. Tell your friends, tell your mom and your dad. I don't know. Tell everybody. <laughs> I'm joined in person by... Hey everybody, Bradley Cox, pastor at Resurrection Church in Greer, South Carolina. We were going to be joined by Luther and John, and he had to bail because of a work thing. But I didn't get this t- teleprompter for nothing. <laughs> I'm kind of proud of myself it's for setting so this cool. up. It's one of the coolest things I've ever gotten. So instead of just piping John in on it and having him on that monitor, I'm going to use it for an, an entire Inquisition episode. So I'm which pretty We have excited. not done in a long time. Which we have not done in forever. But as is tradition, we have Brian Morris who says, Gossip is cancerous. Scripture speaks many times of how harmful it is. Every church has a problem with gossip, yet we seldom see church discipline for it, even for those known to be gospers. I have this going too slow. Should we, <laughs> should we, should we enact church discipline for serial gossip? Why is the church so much less likely to address the sin of gossip than anything else? Well, well, I think you got to define gossip. Well, that's true. You know, um, you know, gossip, um, gossip by its nature is, you know, a talking about someone or something going on in someone's life in a way that in it, it, it is really probably moving in the opposite direction of, of actually helping that person. Right. Um, gossip is rooted in a desire to, um, make myself feel better Mm -hmm. about my own lot or, or circumstances or how well I think I'm doing or performing as compared to this other person. So Mm -hmm. there is, there's not only the, um, unhelpful talk, some of which might not even be true. Yep. I don't think. You know, gossip doesn't necessarily have to include lies, but right. it probably on some levels always includes speculation. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and not with the desire to actually help someone, build someone up, but rather tear them down so as to make myself feel better, look better, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I will say, one, I'm not aware of anyone here who has this issue. <laughs> That was another thing I was going to speak to is like, I don't know that it's fair to say every church has a problem with gossip. Right. Of course, like, I think one of the issues is gossip can happen in an instant. Right. Uh, where it can go from talking about something that has gone on mm-hmm. and easily slide into a little bit of gossip at the tail end, mm-hmm. maybe. And I think there's also a little bit of uh, it's culturally acceptable. More more culturally acceptable than like rank sexual sin, for instance, right. or, or stealing out of the tithes <laughs> right. or insubordination with the pastor or something like that. Right. Um, and it's also a little sneakier. Mm-hmm. It's usually not quite as overt. Yeah. So, so there are there churches that, you know, you have basically the church gossip who is in everybody's business. Like we were just in Second Thessalonians of not busy, but busy, busy bodies. Yep. And those people need to stop, but it's normally more insidious. Right. So. Yeah. And, and maybe some people don't even know how to identify gossip when it happens. You right. know, I mean, conversations start all the time with, have you heard? Right. Or did you know? Right. And here, here I'm going to tell you what you haven't heard or what you haven't known about someone else that might, you know, be juicy or interesting or shocking in a, in a way it's it, it, it there's a thrill seeking aspect to gossip yeah that's a good way to put that and i don't know it maybe one of the reasons why there's not a whole lot of church discipline about it, it, it at least from brian's experience mm-hmm. i would say that's probably true of mine too yeah is that we we don't talk about what it is and what it's not um we haven't right. identified it um you know it's it's pretty easy to identify, you know, uh, or it can be when someone's Mm -hmm. in rank sexual sin or some other type of just egregious 
immorality, but you know, gossip might be a little harder to define. Yeah. Um, yep. and maybe we need to be more aware of what the Bible actually has to say about it. Right. All right. Next question. We'll get, we had to start with Brian, of course. Yep. So we get a couple of dumb ones. So Brad Speed asks, who was more memeable, the Aussie break dancer or the Turkish shooter from the Olympics? Turkish shooter by far. Oh, really? I mean, I don't know. Like the, I like the story of the Turkish shooter better. Me, me too. But the, the break dancing to me just, no offense to. But we're talking about memeable. We're talking about memes. Oh, memes. Okay, memeable. Okay. I got to go with the break dancer because she was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> was she the one that was doing like the yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't even know how to describe it well uh, there's I've seen so many memeable. good memes I of, thought I was trying to laugh. of when she was almost doing like the praying mantis pose like uh, putting her into the Michael Jackson thriller <laughs> video uh, or or uh, there was one of my toddler as soon as we get to church when we worked all week on sitting still in church and strolling all over the floor or <laughs> My dog finding the most vile thing possible in the yard and just rolling all over. Okay, I've changed my stance. You, I think I think I, I heard you say memeable, and I see memeable on that teleprompter, and I think I've heard memorable. Uh, memorable, yes, and absolutely correct. That's on why the Turkish I said the guy. Turkish shooter. But yeah, memeable. Okay, fairly. I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree fairly with convinced you. he got second place on purpose, so as to not break cover. But that's yeah. a story for another time. Yeah. Uh, Ferenc Zinli asks, will well, I cease and desist that other company that did the Westminster ripoff. Did you see this? No, I did not. Uh, company DMT Pedals out of Brazil, who rips off designs and intellectual property from all kinds of other brands, did a custom one-off involving Jonathan Edwards. Really? And it was all black artwork. I'll send you the meme. I memed him into submission. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yeah, he, he posted. Meaning what? So he posted, uh, it was an Edwards fuzz as he labeled it. Mine's the Edwards overdrive, so fair. But it was black art on a gold enclosure, and that's exactly what I do. And I messaged him. I was like, look, man, I'm not trying to start anything, but that's kind of my lane. It's kind of on the nose, whatever. And so he got real nasty. So oh, really? So I just went public, and I said, fine, <laughs> if you want to play that game. You memed him. Yeah, so it was the mom, can we have X at home? Mom, we have X at home. And then X at home is the ripoff. Oh, wow. <laughs> so. And did he back off? He uh, he deleted it. He oh, deleted okay. the post. Okay. So I don't have to s cease and desist him yet. Okay. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we're we not going to talk about the details right now, but we've <laughs> we've had some legal things going on. So, you know, it's thinking about the banks of the river. Yes, 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 so yes. People at our church understand. You might understand eventually. Yeah. <laughs> eventually. No eventually. Doubt. So, Drew Medden, I'm about to lead a small group for the first time. The group will be, holy crap, get ready for this, we'll be going through the whole Bible from September through December. <laughs> <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> I know you guys spoke a little bit in one episode about the best way to go about reading and teaching the Bible, but could you go over that one more time? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, who's this is Drew Medlin? Medden. Medden. Drew, Drew Medden, yes. Medden. Drew, um, you know, if you want to try to do the whole Bible September to December, um, more power to you, <laughs> but I think I, I think I have to be honest and say I don't think that that is the best way to go about reading and teaching the Bible. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's not to say that maybe you know um, at a survey type level you could not maybe go through and um, maybe maybe I don't know emphasize some major themes or or or, mm -hmm. or point out some major themes that you might see like you know you could maybe breeze through the whole life of Abraham and, mm -hmm. you know, um, a survey style class sounds better than a small group discussion based kind of thing. To me. I think so. I think so. Because, you know, if, if your, your question is like, what is the, what do we feel like is the best way to go about reading and teaching the Bible? Um, we feel like the best way is to lead people to carefully consider mm -hmm. what was written. Yep. And 
if, if, if there's anything that's true about this generation and, and the culture that we live in now is we are terrible. We have regressed uh, in terms of careful attentiveness. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the author of Hebrews to write and say, pay, you must, it behooves you, is the word he uses, to pay all the more attention, great detail, at a calculating kind of level, what you've heard, Mm -hmm. specifically about the gospel of Jesus. And so I just, Drew, find it really, really difficult uh, to cover the kind of large chunks of the Bible that you're going to have to cover in order to get through the whole thing in a period of, what, four months? Yeah. Um, That, I just find that that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't, generally lead people to be carefully attentive Mm -hmm. to what's there. Um, We use the acronym, and it comes from the reading scripture class that Brian Onkin, uh, the River Upstate, he's written the curriculum for it. And we use the acronym READ. Recognize what type of literature you're reading, then examine carefully what you've read. And I think in order to do that, I've got to take much, much, much smaller bites than what you're going to have to take in order to cover the whole Bible in four months. Right. So examine carefully, ask why this was written, then decide how to respond. And I think a survey class is good in Mm -hmm. in certain settings, uh, but a small group atmosphere, you might want to consider, let's go through the letters of Paul in four months. Yeah. Yeah. Or let's go through the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph in four months. Mm -hmm. That, I think, gives you a lot more opportunity to just lead people to focus on the details. Right. Um, There's there's not a perfect way to do this, right? No, no. Because uh, there's a trade-off for everything. If you do all topical, then... You, it's really easy to skip over things that you're not comfortable with. If you do pure expository exegetical, then it's easy to only focus on that and not touch on other potential topics that pop up. Right. Stuff like that. Right. Uh, you know, the the ability to pivot. Kind of like a, a small business versus a corporation. Mm-hmm. You know, like as a small business, I can say, oh, no, that schematic didn't work. I'm going to immediately pivot and have it out in a month. Mm. Uh, and so there's always trade-offs. We did, uh, when I first started leading our small group, my wife and I, we started with the Apostles' Creed. Just one with, all right, here's the creed. We can all agree on this, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if we don't agree on this, we probably got problems. Right. But it was a phrase of the creed, you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then the next week was, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. What does, what do those things mean? Where do we get that from the Bible? Right. And so that was, that was good. Yep. Um, but right now our small group structures at res by request of the elders is instead of doing a sermon review, it's basically a textual preview Exactly. where we are reading and considering and discussing the text that will be taught Sunday beforehand. Beforehand. And that's been really, really good for us. Uh, and we've talked about this a bunch on this podcast. Uh, but for one, we're, we've are we already thought about that text going in. And so, all right, where are we going to go? <laughs> and and there are times when just a couple weeks ago, you brought up a point and I was like, dang it, I completely missed that leading mm-hmm. the discussion. But then there's also been times when people have come up or the elders on Monday when you get together have been yeah. like, why did you skirt over that? Uh, yeah. And and I I mean, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't exhaust a text. Right, right. I don't know that I exhaust a text any week right. that I teach. But, and and there's, there's always something that you could improve on, of course, being human. Yeah. But, but you want that kind of feedback of, hey, w- why didn't we go there? Yeah. You know, one thing, Drew, I might ask if I were talking to you is uh, why? Why? Why are you going through the whole? Try to go, going to try to go through the whole Bible in four months. Mm. Um, you may have a great reason for that. It may be something that you know. Actually, the Lord is leading you in because of the people and where they are in the small group that you're leading, or if you are leading the small group. I'm not. I don't know if I'm clear on that, but mm-hmm. I would ask the why question. Yep. Um, why do we feel like we want to try to do that? Is it just so we can? get through the whole Bible, because mm-hmm. I, I might question, you know, the cost to benefit ratio of that. Yeah. 
Uh, I remember, and I've shared this before, I think, but when this was over 10 years ago, um, I made the switch to from topical teaching to expository working through books of the Bible. And Brian Alkin, um, was uh, he and I were meeting and he had encouraged me to start with the gospel of Mark. And that's where we started January mm-hmm. of 2014. I think we started working our way slowly, but surely through the gospel of Mark, taking small bites in order to examine carefully what is written. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, I don't know, a month in two months in, um, sitting down with Brian for coffee one morning and saying to him, you know, Brian, if I keep going at this pace, and I, I, I grabbed my Bible and I pinched the pages of the Gospel of Mark up like this <laughs> and held them up, right? So imagine, the if for those of you that aren't watching, the Bible's laid open, and I take the pages of the Gospel of Mark and hold them up in the middle. And I said, if, if we keep going at this pace, I'm going to spend two years, and in two years I've only taught this much of the Bible. And Brian looked right back at me without batting an eye, and he said, well, at least they'll know that much. Yeah. And I yep. think sometimes our efforts to, I'm not opposed to these read the Bible in a year programs. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not opposed to that, but I think sometimes there there is reason for the Christian to pause and say, you know, I don't want to opt for quantity over quality yep. because every word of that book is inspired. Right. It, every word of that book is the word of God for the people of God. I'm going to tend to opt for more careful, slow, Mm-hmm. meticulous attentiveness yep. to God's word. And personally, in in our small group setting, you've got people in different seasons of their life. Right. Uh, like Especially with our group, because we have late 20s to early 70s, mm-hmm. which is just fantastic. Get more age diversification in your small groups. Um, at least I'm an advocate for it. Anyway, uh, is we're going slowly, and it, I just try to ask good questions. Mm-hmm. And you know, people are going to sometimes have wrong answers, <laughs> and sometimes you'll have the wrong answer, and people will have to call you out, <laughs> right? And uh, but that plus being patient because sometimes it's you're going to go down a rabbit trail, and <laughs> sometimes you need to immediately reel it in. Every now and then, you just need to let it go because they're actually fleshing out the topic a little bit better. Yep. Uh, before you get back. And so ask good questions, be patient. One thing, I'll say this last thing. One reason why I could maybe get on board with this is Mm -hmm. that, and this is just one example. I'm open to being given others. But if, if, if this small group is a small group of new believers who are relatively unfamiliar with the whole of scripture, I could see, all right, let's do a survey of the whole Bible and mm-hmm. then we're going to immediately go into studying a particular book right. more more attentively. You know, like I felt this as we taught through Hebrews. We're nearing the end mm-hmm. here at Res. We've taught through Hebrews, and the author is writing to a first century audience of Jewish Christians, right, who have way more Old Testament savvy than a lot of us modern American Christians do. Mm. And so there are parts of Hebrews where it feels like you're listening to one side of a phone call. He might reference something in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. assuming and knowing that his audience knows the backstory. But yet, in the audience that we have here at Res on Sunday morning, there might be half the people that don't know the backstory at all. Yep. So in that sense, it might be helpful with people who lack some, you know, broader knowledge of scripture and the story of redemption to kind of catch them up in that way Mm -hmm. and then immediately go into diving more deeply into a book. Good stuff. Next from Bill Jacobs, he says, having only recently discovered your podcast, welcome Bill, I'm working through your work, working through your back catalog. Currently I'm in the summer of 2020 and it's given me flashbacks. Bless your heart. What changes that are directly related to the pandemic have re- remained in your churches and worship services? Great question. That's a great question. I would, in terms of arrange, like we, in terms of our actual service structure, nothing changed for us. No. Uh, in terms of arrangement <laughs> of spacing out rows a little more, we got rid of that relatively quickly. There's, a, there's two things I would say 
um, have lasted. Mm -hmm. One is we live stream now. We didn't do that before. That's true. Um, I don't even think about that. Yeah. It, we don't put a whole lot of thought into it, to be honest with you. We continue to provide it because shut it's been and shut ins, people that are out of town, people mm -hmm. that are sick. Yep. Uh, also, people, we have we live in a city where scores and scores of people are moving to this area yep. every week, every month. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to have something out there where people can check us out ahead mm -hmm. of time, that seems to be something people like to do. Yep. We've kept that. And that started with COVID. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, which to me is one of the greatest gifts the Lord brought to our church through COVID is but prior to COVID, we had a lot of spinning plates here at yeah, Res. Yeah. We, we, we are at two services. We're endeavoring to have, we were endeavoring to have children's ministry available at every service we have. Mm -hmm. um, and it was honestly burning my staff members out. Yep. I mean, the, the, f f because a church our size, with the amount of volunteers that we have available to us mm -hmm. and trying to plug, it was literally every week it was trying to plug all those holes. Right. So when COVID hit and everything stopped, all the plates came crashing down. We, we had intentional conversations about which plates we were going to pick back up and which ones we weren't. Yep. And again, back to the quality over quantity thing, we made an intentional decision coming out of COVID that we were only going to provide kids ministry at a high quality level, the amount of times that we could with the volunteers that we had. Right. We we did not opt for, so right now, currently, two services on Sunday, eight services a month. Mm -hmm. If you want to, we have elementary ministry, two of those services out of eight yep. every month. Yep. And we're about to go to a third because our volunteer base has increased. It's right. not that we want to withhold that. Right. It's just that with a church of 400 members, you know, averaging 350 on mm -hmm. Sunday morning, mm -hmm. you, the, the level of volunteers to have it at a high quality level, it, it, it's just, we would be stretching eight feet of carpet over 10 feet of floor. <laughs> yeah. Maybe even worse if, right. and so we just decided coming out of COVID, that's okay. And guess what? Our church is up average attendance. July of 2023 to July of 2024 is up 100 people. Yep. We are growing despite the fact we only have elementary twice a month out of yep. eight services. And honestly, like, I'm not, obviously, I'm not whole hog opposed to kids, church, whatever, but it's good for them to be in the act, the actual service, whatever you want to call it, the church totally, service with everybody. Totally agree. To one, be taught to learn how to be taught, yep. to observe their parents worshiping, yep. and so on. I uh, think it's been healthy for our church, and I'm glad you yeah. brought that up because it's yeah. not just that we don't we don't want to overburden our volunteers. It's mm -hmm. also that we think it's good for yep. kids, at, at least of elementary age, to be yep. in worshiping with their parents. I mean, personal opinion, if we ever build <laughs> and go back to one service, I would love to go to a Sunday school model and then have one service where everybody's in there, that's just my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think I think we're probably on a trajectory at least somewhat similar to that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would also say that we stripped back some of the. We were trending a little bit toward kind of the production performance kind of mindset. No, before that's true. Yep. Before COVID, you're right. you're right. And when that happened, it was just like eh, we're done with that. Forget yeah. all of that. And that's been really good for us too. You know, I have to be careful how I say this and who I say it to, but COVID was good for our church. Yes. Um, and, and not that the pandemic was a good thing. Right. <laughs> Certainly that the people that got really sick or have lingering physical scars from it or lost loved ones, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the it really forced us to evaluate and prioritize in a way that we needed to do. Right. Um, and so I think that's a good third thing that yeah. came out of it. Yeah. 
Uh, next question from Sean Wilkerson. It was a great question. How do I maintain a heart of worship when we do songs I disagree with at church, especially when I'm playing them? We do a few Bethel and Elevation songs, and I usually just kind of shut down when they pop up. I have no reason or desire to create strife over it. The church is amazing. The pastors have their reasons. I don't want to disconnect from worship through song because I don't like where the song came from. Great question. Um, my response would be, what's his name? Sean. Sean. Sean, my response would be, uh, you know, there, there's some key things that you said there. You, The pastors are great. They have their reasons. You seem to love the church. Mm-hmm. You, it, There's just reading between the lines of what you said. It seems like you feel confident this is where the Lord wants you. Mm-hmm. Um no church is perfect. No, no church is full of, you know, perfect decisions on all fronts, uh, particularly when it comes to music selection. My, my question would be, are the songs themselves, despite where they came from, are they biblical or can you sing them and play them thinking biblically or not? If you can't, if there's a song that's put forward I'll, I'll go so far as to say this. If a song itself is put forward that and contains lyrics that are anti-biblical mm-hmm. or can't be rooted in Scripture, yep. I would encourage anybody on my own worship team, don't get on the platform. Mm-hmm. Like if, mm-hmm. if you feel like this is anti-biblical, right? It's one thing for you to not like where the song came from, um, and obviously, preferably have the conversations ahead of time. No, yeah, definitely, <laughs> right? Like have the conversation ahead of time. But it, it, it's one thing. For, let's take a song like um, I, I probably have to be careful picking one here, but <laughs> um, I, let, let's take the song "Cornerstone," mm-hmm. old hill song. Yep, right, ten years plus old. Most of that song is. Not even Hillsong. It's not even Hillsong. It's from the hymn mm-hmm. um, on Christ the Solid Rock. Yep. Right? Um, we still do that song here from time to time, despite the mm-hmm. fact that it came from Hillsong, because we feel like we feel confident we can sing that song biblically. So I think if you can sing the song, play the song, thinking biblically, I don't really see a reason why you can't worship given all the other factors about the church mm-hmm. itself and how you feel about it. Now, as as our church has grown and matured, it, we never put a a hard stop on Bethel Elevation, et cetera. Right. But we're not doing them anymore. But we're not doing them because they're, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. see the episode where we, you know, yeah. kind of dissected the latest Elevation song. Yep. It's like the, the more a church grows and matures, I— it's biblically, I think the less likely you're going to be to be satisfied mm-hmm. with songs coming out of those ministries. Right. I've also heard um, Doug Wilson say, if if you don't agree with a line in a song, in a, in a hymn that you're singing in church, just don't sing it. Yeah. Right. So if there's one, and, and I've done that a couple of times of, should I sing that? And, it, and of course, playing electric guitar, no one can tell when I'm not. <laughs> right. Like I'm, I'm big on actually still singing when I can but if there's a lead line that's a little too weird for me then i don't right right. (laughs) of course uh but there's been a couple lines here and there where it's like maybe i need to process that a little more sure now when wilson talked about in that illustration how you know growing up in church his dad said if if there's a line you disagree with don't sing it right and so that every now and then it was i don't know about that and then they got to they were singing a psalm verbatim and then wilson didn't sing a line and his dad was like What's up? <laughs> this is straight from the Bible. You have to sing that. You yeah. have to agree with that. Right. So uh, if uh, if we sing more psalms, then that kind of starts weeds, we, to weed things out too. Yeah. Creates fewer problems. There you go. So sing more psalms. Uh, last question. This will be good for you or from you uh, with your background, Bradley. David Disharoon. I hope I'm saying that right, but it's fun to say. Is the phrase or concept of pleading the blood of Jesus biblical? Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's asking? In one sense, yes. In one sense, no. Right. Um, you know, I, th- I think people, phrases like this were thrown around in my Pentecostal charismatic 
upbringing, Mm -hmm. um, really in a way that looking back on it seems like superstitious. Right. Almost like the way people treat praying in Jesus' name. Yep. They get to the end of their prayer and in Jesus' name, amen, as if Abracadabra. That, yeah, yeah, abracadabra, as if that little stamp on the end is going to make it more effective. And then I think some people treat that phrase, pleading the blood, mm-hmm. as if that's going to somehow make the praying more effective. Right. Uh, that, I think, is entirely unbiblical. Right. That, that, that the blood of Christ is sort of waiting on us to plead for it mm-hmm. in order for it to... In order for us to be protected, provided for, healed, uh, the, all the typical word yeah, of faith stuff, yeah, the threat of the enemy wreaking havoc, etc. Mm-hmm. That's unbiblical. Right. Here's where maybe it's not unbiblical: is that you know we're we're actually coming up on this in Hebrews this Sunday, where um, the author of Hebrews talks about the blood of Christ speaking better than the blood of Abel. Right. So. What does he mean by that? Well, the blood of Abel is a reference back to the first family had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel because he's jealous over Abel's sacrifice of being accepted by God and Mm -hmm. his own sacrifice being rejected by God. And there's some stuff we can unpack there, but the point is the blood of Abel speaks of acceptable sacrifice acceptable worship. Mm -hmm. And the author of Hebrews says, Jesus's blood speaks better than the blood of Abel. In what sense? That it's an acceptable sacrifice for the propitiation of our sins. You know, 1 John chapter 2, John writes and says, I write these things so that you might not sin. Mm -hmm. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And so, there is a sense in which I think all believers can lean on, plead the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, we come to the Lord's table, right? And mm-hmm. and we remember his broken body and shed blood. Yep. Um, th- there's a sense in which we are pleading the blood there. Right. Uh, but there's also a sense in which the blood of Christ pleads for us. Yes. Uh, and so I think you could think biblically about that, but my encouragement would be, don't treat it as a rabbit's foot that you can sort of throw around with your praying that's going to somehow make it more effective. Right. I think every time I've heard someone use that phrase, it has been that way. Right. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't ever use it, uh, but like you said, it's more of, uh, really, if we if we look at what the blood of Jesus accomplishes, it's the forgiveness of sins, uh, the exhaustion of God's wrath toward his, his people. It's not about... Uh, will I be able to make my car payment or right. something along those lines? Exactly. Now, you, I, if anything, you would appeal to God in his providence mm-hmm. uh, or anything like that uh, in your praying for those kinds of issues. And those are good things to pray about. Right. We should pray about everything. Yeah. Uh, but that's not, we, we need to let the Bible uh, create our categories for us as opposed to us trying to back up the dump truck of, all of our traditions that we've grown up with and all that kind of thing. And it doesn't seem like the blood of Jesus applies to those kinds of things. Right. It, 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 you could use that phrase, particularly if you use it superstitiously and, and, and in so doing misrepresent the atonement and what it accomplishes and what yep. it does not. Yep. You know, the, the Bible is clear. There are denominations that will argue, you know, to the mat over this. Mm-hmm. But the the phrase in Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed, yep. does not guarantee physical healing in this life. Right. That we could plead the blood of Jesus mm-hmm. that was shed when he was flogged. We could plead that blood in order to guarantee physical healing. That That is um, really an abuse of the atonement. Yep. Right? The atonement, we are healed in what sense? That we are delivered out of slavery to sin and and become slaves to righteousness. We're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We are healed in that we were once children of wrath, now we're children of God. Right. That's the sense in which the blood, you know, um, or his stripes have healed yep. us. As a good post-mill guy, I'm sometimes accused of immunitizing the eschaton mm-hmm. of bringing too much s of the end into now but what the word of faith movement does in 
pleading the blood of Jesus for my healing now, that's actually immunitizing the eschaton Mm. and bringing in what is promised in the resurrection. Because even if you are temporarily healed, you're still going to die. That's right. You're not going to live forever. That's right. And that's what the resurrection is for. And that's what Jesus' resurrection sealed for us. Exactly. Amen. So, anything else? That's good. Good stuff. Good questions. Good questions. Let's do it again real soon. Uh, Less than a year from now. (laughs) Go love God. Love your neighbor. Next musical. See you next time.